uh, I would like to say what I want to discuss with you. The first point is uh, why there is so much of concern about penicillin residue. That municipal quantity does it really create a harm? And unless and until that is convinced to your people, I believe the res respect that they need to give to this aspect of contamination may not be in place. I am to discuss a little bit about types of beta lactams. What are the regulatory requirements? And as I would explain to you, I am going to talk about uh, my own study, case study where a cephalosporin facility was converted into a general facility formulation block. Cross-contamination control measures, whatever we adapted for this, I'm going to discuss with you, followed by regulatory observations, and there are some references. Friends, if you see in most of the companies, the scenario is like you have a methane beta lactam block, we have a general block, you have a penem block, we have a cephalosporin block, penicillin, so many things are situated in different buildings, but on the same premises. So and that's where the lot of risk is coming into place and it is good for all of you as pharmaceutical professionals to address that risk properly and I'm here to help you to address that risk. So let's go. Why so much of concern? I want to share with you my experience of 2001. I had a colleague in packaging development, a very good reviewer. But I thought his uh, career is getting uh, blocked. He needs to get some better opportunity. So I put him as a reviewer for batch documentation. We had a common back document room for general and beta lactam block. He was trained onto the BMR reviewer uh, and then he was put onto the job. And as he was turning on the pages of the batch manufacturing document, he suddenly developed allergy, all rashes everywhere, sneezing, coughing, and we really got worried what has happened. So we rushed him to the hospital, and the doctor said that uh, it is because of penicillin allergy. And you know the reason? The reason was when he was turning the papers of the BMR, there is a penicillin residue, unvisible penicillin residue, which was sitting on the paper, which touched his hand and that developed the allergy. Now with this example, I hope you will be convinced that why there is so much of regulatory concern on penicillin contamination. Many times my experience is that unless the matter goes to the head and heart of your people, they don't understand, they don't realize, they may listen to your thought, they may listen to your lecture, they may score 100 out of 100 in the examination. But when it goes to the shop layer, at the back of mind, they may see why I'm taking 500 milligram of amoxicillin and why should I be bothered about minuscule quantity of carrier? I think that's where the fundamental job needs to be taken into care. So what are the allergic responses? Yes, you can have rashes all around, immunological uh, response due to immunoglobulin E. Then there is a hay fever, asthma, hives, and the last one is uh, could be a fetal, that is anaphylactic shock. I remember we were making immunoglobulin D out of placental blood in my first company uh, that was Dufar Interpan, a Dutch company. And uh, this is immunoglobulin E, which is actually responsible for that. Look at the scary scenario. Uh, keep aside uh, the absolute authenticity of the figures here show. Take it as just indicating because this percentage will vary from country to country, population to population. But nevertheless, it is very much true for India also. The percentage may not be high as it is stated here in India. But here, the uh, patients who visited the clinic, about 11,761, one patient reported history of uh, penicillin allergy. Hmm? And that comes to just around 6% uh, who had actually reported penicillin allergy. Rem remaining people had not reported about the penicillin allergy. Rashes were developed in about 37% people, hives 18%, anaphylaxis, which is very critical and it could be fatal, that is about 6.8%. And the most worrying factor was that uh, 
only 6% people knew that they had penicillin allergy and that was reported to the doctor by them so that doctor was careful while prescribing the medicines and this is the response uh, coming from this particular reference let's look at the type of beta lactams hmm? we have five types of beta lactams penicillin cephalosporins penems carbacephins monobactams now this is ampicillin you can see here the beta lactam ring which is very common in all these uh, structures that you see here this is common but what is different are the side chains now look at what is the difference in the side chains here i have summarized it here yes four membered lactam ring three carbon one nitrogen cyclic amide is common everywhere what is uncommon is that penicillins contain six amino penicillin acid group which is uh, you can see this six amino penicillin acid in ampicillin and there is uh, a seven amino cephalosporinic acid and cephalexins and you can see here seven amino penicillin cephalosporinic acid Penem beta lactam ring is fused to a saturated five-membered ring containing one sulfur atom. So this is in a pen that you can see the structure here. <clears throat> Carbapenem similar to sepen but with a carbon substituted for sulfur. So you can see here the structure of lura carbap. You can see here what is substituted there. And lastly, monobactams, beta lactam ring stands alone and not fused to other thing. You can see here monobactam, you can see here beta lactam ring, there is no ring attached to it, it is in isolation as compared to different structure. That's the structural difference between them and that is what it makes them behave in a substantially different manner. For example, all you know that penicillins, cephalosporins, uh, you need to have beta lactamase along with that so which can kill the actually basically any potential enzyme that can kill the effectiveness of antibiotics then we had penems which were found to be resistance from this direction then carbacephins monobactams and because of indiscriminate use of all these antibiotics uh, this is the development which has taken place i don't know whether it's good or bad but uh, ultimately scientists have to find some cure to treat the patient properly. The story doesn't end here. The, there are some other big tilactamase inhibitors which uh, basically we need to control. The same control like penicillin, beta lactams that we talked about, clavulinic acid, tazobactam, sulbactams. Clavulinic acid, many of you must have seen that it is given along with amoxicillin. Uh, together so when you are making a formulation containing amoxicillin and clavulinic acid the regulatory expectation is not that you just bother about cross contamination of amoxicillin but you also bother about cross contamination of clavulinic acid why because they also contain beta lactam ring coming to api manufacturing let's say you're manufacturing only six api and supplying it to some other API manufacturer to convert it into penicillins or cephalosporins, even 6 APA cross contamination needs to be controlled. Read the regulation. What does 21 CFR 211.176 say? That the limit of detectability of the method needs to 0 0.006 ppm as penicillin G using sarsinutia and a volatile detection limit of 0 0.03 ppm. Now, our problem is that, okay, you are talking only about PNG, which is hardly being uh, described nowadays. So, what do uh, the limit I follow for cephalosporins, cephalexins, other type of penicillins? So, that is where a lot of discretionary element comes into picture. But friends, take it as a guidance and then follow the risk-based approach to your entire methodology, which is found to be acceptable to regulatory bodies. Now, what does the detection amount of 0 0.03 ppm say? The further uh, part of the statement needs to be read that it reflects the method's limit with respect to confidence and reproducibility and does not represent a tolerance level. 
Now, there is a catch here. On one hand, you say that 0 0.03 ppm should be detected with a confidence. Then the method must have the limit of quantification, which is equivalent to 0 0.03 or less. And you say that none of the swabs should have a detectable amount of penicillin. So that has come into an interpretation where 0 0.03 micrograms is considered as a violative quantity by many companies and it has not been questioned by regulators. Some more to 1.42 operations related to manufacturing, processing, packaging shall be performed in separate facilities. Friends, I may hear like to mention that separate facilities does not mean separate building. But today, if any of the inspectors see that in the same building you are making penicillins and non-penicillins, I don't think he's going to accept. So the bottom line today is that though all these regulations are in place, the interpretations are always risk best. EHU for penicillin should be completely separate. And coming to section 211.176, it says that if there is a possibility, if the possibility exists that cross-contamination can take place, then you need to detect the amount of penicillin and non-penicillin parts. That's what the regulation says. Coming to EU GMP, almost same but not as clear with respect to limits like what uh, FDA is saying, US FDA is saying. It says, yes, relevant residues should be determined and there should be a facility which is dedicated facility. What is dedicated? I mean, dedicated manufacturing, dedicated AHOs. But again, here, the emphasis is not exactly on separate building. Let me talk to you about one of the inspections. Uh, incidentally, this was my first inspection, USFD inspection, 2001. Uh, of course, there are, afterwards, there are many, could be more than 25, and some of them were with uh, penicillin facilities. So there is a reasonably good understanding about what regulators expect today. The inspection was for the products manufactured in general block, but what happened is that inspector spent 3.5 days discussing only about beta-lactam cross-contamination because on the same premises, we had a general block, we had a penicillin block, we had a cephalosporin block, we had a penance block, so on and so forth. To the moment he, he had come fully studied with this, so he started discussing only about beta-lactam cross-contamination and he grilled us for about 3.5 days and one of the uh, observations that he gave us was about detectability of the method detectability of the method has to be as per AOAC and that I talked to you about method having a detectability of 0 0.006 ppm and a violative limit of 0 0.03 ppm so we worked in 2001 and uh, we really were successful after a lot of trials and errors to develop a method, which is a microbiological method. Cylinder plate, you can see the cylinders. There is a base layer. There is a seed layer containing sarsina lutea, glass plates 20 into 100 mm. As a cylinders were put on that. All the six cylinders were at an angle of 60 degree and with a radius of about 2.8 mm. And we targeted a zone diameter of 2020. Plot was done, and from that concentration was arrived. And happy to say that at that point of time, we could achieve this detectability of 0 0.006 microgram per ml of amoxicillin. But is this just good today? I think in today's scenario, uh, it can be followed as an additional measure, but it doesn't hold completely true because you could be manufacturing. 10 types of cephalosporin, five types of uh, penicillins. Now, how do, how do I measure the response due to all of them? All of them will respond here and create a zone of inhibition. Now, that's where the cash lies. So it has led to the development of ultra-sensitive methods, which I'm going to talk 
property in subsequent slides. So there is a challenge meeting the FDA requirement with respect to LOD and LOQ. No detectable amount of in the sample, that is what the guideline says, but how do I interpret? What is the quantity of the swab I should take? What is the quantity of the air I should take? How do I interpret when multiple beta alexins are handled? That's a challenge. What are the gray areas? Coming to swab surface, how much surface I really take? Somebody takes five by five centimeters, somebody takes 10 by 10 by centimeters. I have seen different practices in different companies. What is the SAS surface? Again, a discretionary element. What is the MOC of the swap? What is the recovery percent that you should have minimum? How to interpret when multiple beta lacsimta are handled? I already talked to you about that. Coming to air sampling, how do we decide the quantity of the air to be sampled? Where to sample? And what is the rationale for the quantity of the air to be sampled? What is the best time to sample? Now, these are the gray areas. Interpretation, all beta lactams that we talked to you about in micro. Yardstick for API, when you are manufacturing API, how do I see that if I have API units manufacturing penicillins and non-penicillins in the same premises, what should be the permissible contamination of non-beta lactam into a beta lactam, sorry, beta lactam contamination to a non-beta lactam API? Coming to intermediates like 6 APA that we talked to you about, what should be the acceptable uh, amount? And interpretation of regulatory requirements is also a gray area. There's high time that we need a guideline which is crystal clear on this aspect. I'm seeing the re uh, requirements are increasing day by day. Approach is changing towards inspection as the new knowledge is gathered. They're following life cycle approach. What I mean by life cycle approach is that if we have packed the goods from year end until the customer receives it, somebody handles the product pack. And if there's a residue hand sitting on the product pack, could be a primary pack, could be a secondary pack, or could be a tertiary pack. And if there are possibilities of penicillin contamination, that's something which is uh, going to be objectionable. Physical barriers between the building, though guidelines do not talk about it, but there are inspections which are talking about necessity of physical barriers built with buildings. The whole approach is risk best, and the example which I am going to show to you is the best example for this. No commonality of even top people, because most of the companies have top people like head of quality, head of manufacturing, operational head. They are common for all the blocks which contain beta lactams and non beta lactams. So that is also somewhere getting questioned and they are talking about completely independent handling of beta lactam blocks. Impact of neighboring environment. I have seen some companies got cited though they were not manufacturing any beta lactams, but they were cited for having lack of control on beta lactams as the adjacent factories their manufacturing penicillins. <clears throat> so whatever decontamination that you do, they are asking for the proof of that, documentary proof. That means really beta lactam is deactivated or not. That's one of the things which if you follow sodium hydroxide, sodium oxychloride, or any other agent that you do, it may be written in literature, but with whatever condition that you have, for different kind of surfaces, asking for the proof of decontamination. There are a lot of inspector-specific expectations. Now, every inspector is expert in particular areas. Nobody is expert in all the areas. And based on the expertise, uh, newer requirements keep on coming, and they are based on the risk-based interpretation of the inspector. And you, you cannot question that where it is there in the guidelines. Sorry, that's not acceptable. This is a risk bus approach which is emerging. To tell you, at the, every inspection that we have, something or the other comes out as a new chapter for OS investigation. No, guidelines have not changed, but the approach has changed because of life cycle, 
and because of the risk that is connected. Now, coming to COVID-19, of course, the biggest risk is COVID infection risk, which I'm not going to talk to you about. WhatsApp University is talking day in and day out about that, so I will not like to spend time on that. But I'm talking about uh, the effects which are going to be there because of inadequacy of power. In inadequacy of manpower, when it is not there, how can you ensure the independence of the site? How will you be able to ensure the social distancing because of which the manpower is going to get? Sometimes maybe you will have a one shift working. Normally you work for three shifts or normally you work for two shifts and you are going to work now for one shift. Now, when you are going to shut up the AHOs, which is the practice in many of the companies, which was challenged by uh, many regulators, but uh, I know I got a very critical observation and the inspector says, no, no, you cannot shut up the factories after working hours. You have to keep it on for 24 hours. But then uh, we said, okay, let us give an, uh, please give us an opportunity to approach MHRA and convince from our side that uh, based on the risk, we feel it is okay. And I'm happy to say that finally, MHRA came and said, oh, okay, it's, your practice is okay, provided one, two, three, four. <coughs> Is it acceptable to release products to market if no penicillin is found on testing? Certainly not okay. You are going to be cited because testing into compliance or relying only on testing is not okay today. All of you are aware that we need uh, built-in quality and unless the built-in quality is there, your product is not going to see the light of the day. If they would not condone the shipment of potentially contaminated trucks, that happened to test negative for penicillin. Now I'm going to talk to you about a case study which deals with facility conversion. As I mentioned to you, we had a formation facility manufacturing cephalosporin. Only three batches were taken, registration batches of two stands. Otherwise the facility was not used, but nevertheless batches were manufactured. And for some reasons, uh, which are, um, Companies say that uh, no, no, we want to convert it into a non penicillin block. And that is uh, the question was posed to me can we do it? I'm going to share with you all that story in the next slides. So I'm going to share with you all the knowledge gained there. What are the methodologies that we use? What criteria was used for acceptance? Data generated, evidence generated, what conclusions we drew? All that I have to share. In my presentation. So existing cephalosporin OHD and there were other non-penicillin blocks and also a penicillin block in the same premises. Look at the complexity. We have cephalosporin block, you have penicillin block, you have a general block and uh, now you want to convert the cephalosporin into a general block. So there was a proposal and the markets we involved were uh, EU and USA. What I did was I discussed with uh, my colleagues in the industry. I told my boss that I need some time and uh, I will revert to you in about two, three days time. When I discussed with all my colleagues, they said firmly, say, say no, they said Vijay, don't go for this. This will never see the light of the day. But somewhere down the line, I was not convinced, but I said today everybody is talking about risk-based, risk-based, risk-based. If I can prove that there is no risk of cross-contamination, it should get through theoretically. And then I came across a Japanese case study for conversion of Cephalosporin API facility into a general API, and that was a very good reference for me. Uh, many of the things which was done for this, we adapted in our case, but not necessarily all. So this is the case study which we referred, beta lactam decontamination and cleaning validation of a pharmaceutical manufacturing facility. So what was done here is that cephalosporin API manufacturing facility was converted into a general API manufacturing facility. And like us, they also had on the same side the block manufacturing general category of the API. There were five buildings. Five buildings, API and intermediate manufacturing. The name of the company is Toyoma Japan. One of the manufactured uh, five cephalosporins. 
This was in use since 1984, but somewhere in 1998, they thought to convert it to a single bar. So what was done by Toyama was they categorized into three, uh, the level A, level B, and level C. Level E is the area where penicillin orbital actum or cephalosporin handling was done. B is the area where actually the handling was not done, but the, there has been a moment of the people, moment of the product. And then you have C where no handling was done. B was further divided into two. Level one uh, did not handle beta lactam, but had material, mepal, product containment there. So we also had a similar scenario because the block that uh, I talked to you about not only manufactured uh, OSDs on tablet capsules, but there was an injectable block also. And they were hardly used, not, not hardly used, they were never used, only capsule section was used. So in our case, large component was falling into B and C, same as what Toyoma was observing that A is here, B is here, little bigger than that, C is here. So it starts with complete risk assessment by careful thinking, challenging your methodology. Then you comprehensive decontamination protocol was prepared. FDA, the company contacted US FDA that what should be the acceptance criteria because as I mentioned to you, no when the guidelines, they are so specific for this kind of scenario. And three levels of contamination were defined, level A, level B, level C that I talked to you. Level A, manufactured, beta laxant manufactured, B, not manufactured, but people and product movement has taken place. C, nothing has happened. <clears throat> so activities carried out, they were decontaminated with reagent solution, floors, walls, ceilings, exteriors. Gypsum walls were replaced. Our other walls finished with epoxy because epoxy prevents the plating. Concrete floors coated with epoxy paint. Remember, in pharma, in, in case of us, this was not applicable because all the critical areas were having already epoxy coating. And the layer uh, were quite proof from that perspective. The region solution that were used, that NAOH 0.5%, NAOCL 0.5%, and SDS, which is basically for surface active agent, these two are used for penicillin deactivation. And the contact time was 15 seconds, and this was duly validated. Unless the validation is placed, the regulators will not accept. Coming to activities carried out, equipments were dismantled and discontaminated, decontaminated. Urities and HVAC were decontaminated, gasket seals replaced, and complete HVAC was replaced. In our case, it is a little different scenario, which I'm going to talk to you. All the insulation was removed and decontaminated. Of course, it was replaced along with the air shoes. Coming to electrical fixtures and lighting, <clears throat> they were removed, decontaminated, and replaced. Explosion type lighting decontaminated, non explosion lighting and outlets removed. Now, explosion type lighting. This is the explosion type lighting and this is non explosion type of lighting. So wherever there is an explosion type of lighting that was replaced and as far as non explosion type of lighting is there, that was decontaminated and uh, fit into the place properly. Coming to documents and spares, documents were decontaminated as applicable and they were removed to a different site. Now, in our case, uh, we did a little differently. I will share with you. As you know, Japan is the only country in the world which is Seven Sigma, that is zero defect company. And look at what the study what length of study that they did. Concrete test pieces were taken. They were impregnated with 5 beta lactam. Then they were decontaminated. Epoxy painting was done. And then shaft samples were taken at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, up to 60 months. Same as what 
stability schedule that you have and this was done as per the fda suggestion 60 month study was completed in 2004 and none of the swabs should residue uh, of any of the vital actants so <clears throat> FDA suggested that there could be a possibility that penicillin can bleed out from the epoxy, uh, but this is something uh, which proved that no bleeding takes place. Sampling was done with the swab, 100 square centimeter, it was dipped in phosphate buffer PS7, and you can imagine the amount of testing done: 1277, 178, and 1653 swab samples were taken for level a b and c respectively that we talked about recovery was more than 70 percent uh, with 200 nanogram for concrete surface and of course it was with epoxy band. analytical procedures adopted were analytical uh, including microbiological technology then there is a lcms ms which is nowadays gaining momentum with respect to this area all five digital actoms uh, should be detected that is what the acceptance criteria was and they decide, decided that detection level should be 0.6 nanogram to 1 nanogram per square centimeter of swab surf now let's say you are having 100 square centimeter of uh, total swab surface then that 100 square centimeter will contain 1 into 100 that is 100 nanogram of uh, uh, beta lactam, which comes to about uh, 0.1 microgram. API less than 5 to 20 nanogram per gram. That was the acceptance criteria that they were manufacturing non beta lactam APIs and they tested those non beta lactam APIs. And the acceptability was each gram should contain less than 5 to 20 because they had different uh, beta lactams beta it's a bit of different cephalosporins and for each cephalosporin the limit was different absence of cleaning residue was checked by toc in laboratory the result was that yes the facility got finally the approval from uh, the us fda they accepted that your methodology is okay excellent job done and what Japan did was in total collaboration with USFDA. So if tomorrow somebody says that facility conversion is not acceptable to USFDA, I think you can always question that thing. Now this was an uh, ideal reference for us. How did we do in our case? I already informed you about the nature of the plant that this was a cephalosome facility, dedicated one, but on the same plot, we had uh, a penicillin facility, we had a general block, and all were formulation facilities. The example which we talked to you about Toyama was the API facility. So there were many issues different because uh, in normally pharma manufacturing, much more care is taken with respect to surfaces, ceiling, floors, and all that lighting which may not be the requirement for the api manufacturing so the risk assessment was done the protocol was prepared how are we going to go about it taking into consideration all the inputs that we talked about equipments were disassembled and decontaminated before the inspections was done equipments were dismantled but we got the observation that dismantling is not okay you need to disassemble. Now, uh, what is the difference between uh, disassembling and uh, the uh, conventional uh, cladding that you do? In disassembling, you are virtually taking every part out and cleaning it. But in conventional cleaning, we don't do that. AHU's internal external surface was decontaminated dismantling was done wherever essential of as far as the AHUs are concerned AHUs were flushed with air for three days swap sampling was taken recovery was more than 80 percent so here the point i am trying to make is that based on the risk 
the decision was taken not to replace the AHUs because as I mentioned to you, only three batches were taken, that two only in one section. And we found that uh, the risk is not there. All dresses were decontaminated and destroyed previously used dresses. All documents were destroyed except masters. Of course, the electronic copies were kept. Air sampling was done for exhaust points, AHU area, change rooms, so on and so forth. Apart from this, air sampling was done. There was sampling is being carried out, dispensing is carried out, processing is carried out, core processing is carried out, primary and secondary packaging is concerned, and the supplier points. Coming to AHU decontamination, a little bit of more details onto that. All existing filters were decontaminated 1% in OH, which is slightly higher concentration as compared to what uh, we discussed with respect to Japanese case study. Uh, and this was duly validated that it does really destroy that beta lactam ray. All filters were replaced with the new ones. Supply HEPA, return riser, exhaust HEPA, that is what the filters I talked to you. Insulation was completely removed. AHU ducts dispensed wherever necessary to facilitate the proper cleaning because it's very difficult to reach every nook and corner of the duct. So wherever we fail that there is a scope uh, for powder to not get clean, uh, that part was dispensed. Internal and external surface decontaminated and are rinsed. <clears throat> coming to capsule filling machine, because of uh, one of the major observations coming in MHR inspection that uh, only dismantling is not okay. You need to disassemble the equipment and check for everything. So as a result of that, uh, apart from contact parts, a lot of non-compact parts were checked and you can see here those like uh, bushes for loading assembly, magazine holding plate, discharge upper plate, discharge capsule tube, so on and so forth. If I count the number of sampling points for capsule filling machine that exceeded 25 coming to non-contact and contact parts. The method that was followed uh, at that point of time was uh, HPLC, but now the company has developed uh, the LCMS evidence method also. And what I want to talk to you about this very useful reference. You can go through this methodology, and I feel this is one of the best methods which can detect the amount up to 0.2 ppb of amoxicillin and limit of quantification is 2 ppb sorry 0.2 ppb and 2 ppb so eight beta lactams were separated as you can see in this graph column temperature 35 sampler 4 degree gradient system runtime 80 minutes so this was the method which was followed uh, that we had a column Basically, reverse phase chromatography, sensitivity was 20 ppb to 10 ppm, mobile phase, flow, injection 10 microliter, and time was 5 minutes. And the achieved uh, LOD, LOQ was 10 and 30 for cephalex cell. As I mentioned to you, uh, because of the uh, regulatory insistence, methods have been revamped, HPLC method was revamped. LCMS was developed. Now, so coming to inspection, yes, the proposal was made in somewhere about 2013. The team did an excellent job, and the facility was expected in inspected in 2015. I'm not naming the company because of obvious reasons, uh, because there is some uh, agreement which uh, prohibits us from disclosing the name of the company. We were extensively grilled. I think about uh, 2.5 out of three days, uh, uh, he was talking about only uh, the cephalosporin contamination. There were some findings. 
including majority were the other category one, some were uh, major, none was critical. So they were all complied and uh, after reviewing the compliance, after having a lot of deliberations, discussions, MHRA finally cleared the facility for the manufacture of general category products. And I feel this is the unique achievement for the team. To the best of my knowledge, I have not come across any company uh, which basically has done this. If somebody has done it, please share, and I think that will be a beautiful knowledge tag for me. <clears throat> Let's talk about some of the regulatory observations. Some observations, some are from FDA, some are from MHRA. <clears throat> Equipment not clean beyond a conventional dismantling. As you know, we already discussed about it. And what is the difference between dismantling instead of dismantling? <clears throat> Lot of mobiles are assembled here. There is a Chinese company or the US company. We provide all these spare parts here and we do here the assembly of them. And that's the kind of cleaning which uh, they expect, especially when you are going for uh, a conversion of the facility, not for a non conversion type of scenario. <coughs> Sorry, I was taking a glass of water. <coughs> Then there was a commitment required not to use the equipment again for non metal items. So whatever equipments were there in Sipable Spring block, <coughs> even, even when all this contamination was proven, they said that we need a commitment that you will not use them again for any non beta lactam products. The employee code was found to be the same for two persons. You can imagine the amount of record that we check. Just to give some insight into this, I have quoted this observation for your reference. <clears throat> Access control system should generate documentary evidence. Now, many of you have the access control system, and only the authorized people can access. <clears throat> but the inspector asks that there should be a daily printout that who entered in which block and somebody should supervise and certify on daily basis that only authorized people have entered inside the block. So that kind of documentary proof needs to be generated from the system. <clears throat> Many companies have a common QC lab for testing beta lactams and non beta lactams. The requirement was that there should be an access control system at par with manufacturing block. Whenever QC samplers are going to penicillin or cephalosporin block, there was an authorization form. And so those authorization forms were checked, and some forms were found to be incomplete by inspectors. The lean in color of all visitors is same means the visitors going to penicillin block and non-penicillin block, the color is same. The requirement is that you should have a difference there so that it helps you to control even the visitors. Kappa not extended to other areas. So let me uh, brief you about that. Now there is an adjacent uh, penicillin block. There is an adjacent general block. Now, we need to come whether any cephalosporin is going into a penicillin category product and vice versa. If there is a scope for any penicillin product to get into a cephalosporin product. And why this? Because there are instances where it is found that people are allergic to penicillin but not to cephalosporins and vice versa. But generally, in huge, more than 90%, it doesn't happen. But in some cases, it does happen. But anyway, let's not bother about that. What is important is that penicillin into non-penicillin, penicillin into uh, cephalosporins, cephalosporin to penicillin, cephalosporin to general category product, 
<laughs> so that needs to be checked if you have uh, that kind of risk scenario at your end. Simultaneous entry of two persons with access on car. This happens with many companies that somebody accesses the door and by the time the door get closed, multiple people enter inside. So there has then there is no control because the the data will show only X, Y, Z entered, whereas actually A, B, C, B, C, D, and D, Z, D, E also entered. Finally, I, I want to present uh, to you a food for thought. What is that food for thought? A very scary scenario. And this is where I think uh, uh, something will have to be done by proactive companies and proactive rulers. That out of 598 dairy products, Kari, this is about Nigeria. The overall mean pelicin residue obtained in milk no, no, and Vara was 15.22, 8.24, and 7.6 microgram per liter. Now imagine the scenario that if I take a one liter of milk per day, I'm going to get 15 into say thousand nanogram into my body, 15,000 nanogram, and that uh, microgram not nanogram, microgram. This is a very, very high quantity as compared to what is tolerated as an acceptance level. Now, the studies have been done here. I was trying to search whether somebody has done this kind of studies in India. I could not get, get into that. Or maybe somebody has done the work. If not done, uh, I'm associated with a lot of colleges also. And this is one of the projects I intend to give it to them that you should study the quantity of the milk, quality of the milk, and check them for traces of penicillins to avert a future strategy. And we should not wait for COVID 19 like situation happening. So I think this is just a food for thought. This is not necessarily 100% connected to the topic that pharma manufacturing but this is an additional food safety that i talked to you the intention was just to sensitize you about the science. these are the references uh non-penicillin beta lactam drug the cgmp framework for preventing cross contamination a very very good reference you must read it completely the requirement for manufacturing highly active or sensitizing drugs uh, this is coming into acta biomed a review of procedures for detection of residual penicillin in drug, uh, Gordon Carter, November 77. Human drug CGMP notes, so on and so forth. So with this, uh, I want to say a big thank you to all of you. And uh, my contact details are here. You can always contact me for any of the queries that you have with respect to uh, the presentation because I know all questions cannot be answered today. Thank you so much once again for the patient uh, listening from your side and uh, the presence that you have shown for this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vijay, uh, for an excellent presentation. I'm sure delegates and participants would really appreciate the efforts which you have put in making this presentation. So we'll take a few questions now. Uh, yes. I'll just briefly go through this and see, uh, try to bucket them. So there are a few questions on coupon studies, you know, for uh, what, what you mentioned in one of one of your slides. So can you Please can you share, share uh, coupon, coupon study? Coupon? Yes. I talked about swabs. Yeah, yeah, correct. So anyway, coming to swab study, let me uh, tell you that the surface was 10 into 10 centimeter, that is 100 square centimeter. And the type of swab which was used was a polyester swab. The, the, uh, the, the swab was first dipped in uh, phosphate pH 7 buffer. And then um, with, when it is in wet condition, the 10 by 10 centimeter area was swapped and then 
uh, it was dipped again in 10 ml of the uh, phosphate buffer and then the estimation was done thank you now you you talked about you know dismantling and disassembling of equipments and other things and decontaminating the whole place so there is a question about you know uh, water system is always going on in all these uh, manufacturing facilities so how, do you need to disassemble and decontaminate or replace the water system how that is to be done uh, when you are converting a facility any thoughts on this as i mentioned to you during my presentation the question of disassembling comes into picture when you are going for facility conversion but as long as you continue to manufacture for the same category of products whether it is penicillin or cephalosporins disassembling is not the expectation for cleaning what is normally expected is dismantling but again this is a risk based approach that one needs to take thank you uh, this is about analytical method uh, you have given reference to lc msms methods for de decontamination studies uh, do you know any references or is it possible to use hplc methods yes uh, i think uh, one of my clients is using hplc method which has been verified and uh, found to be okay and uh, the uh, the difference is that the client is able to perform a large quantity of the inspection no, sorry large quantity of the injection which is 500 microliters instead of conventional 10 microliter 5 microliter all that with that large quantity of the injection uh, he is able to achieve the required detectability that is loq and nod for the hplc method to also so in nutshell yes hplc method is also acceptable thank you uh, you spoke about limits for you know how much is a carryover and the contamination limit are there any limits for effluents you know if if there is a facility which has a zero, a zero discharge uh, policy then you know what how will you handle the effluent contamination any limit for the residue in the effluents the uh, the general guideline is that when you test the effluent it should not have any detectable amount of beta lactam now the question is how much quantity of the effluent you need to take you need to test 10 ml 100 ml 1 liter and how do we really extract the penicillin out of that these are million dollar questions and that's where the discretionary power of the quality and overall operations uh, comes into picture thank you uh, then this is a question about facility I think you have clearly explained this, but you can do it once again. Uh, can we manufacture penicillin and general OSD in the same premises? As per guideline, okay, but in reality, form no, because this will not be acceptable. As I mentioned to you, uh, the inspectors are following risk-based approach. They are not virtually going into verbatim the guideline. So today, no way you can manufacture in the same building. And same premises? Different same buildings? premises that I already talked about, that uh, same premises is OK. The, okay. the requirement is that uh, you need to think about the wind direction which prevents the contamination from coming and secondly the distance between the facilities should be good enough now what is that good enough is again a bit of discriminatory but i think if you have a limit of more than 75 meters generally i have seen from my own experience that uh, it is considered as acceptable by the regulators thank you uh can we manufacture penicillins and cephalosporin in the same block answer is same no but if you i strictly speak about guidelines they talk about separate facilities 
and that those separate facilities could exist in the same building so they have to be manufactured in uh, separate buildings with complete independence thank you now this is a very specific question see if you can answer otherwise we can just skip this uh, one of my vendor controls 6 apa with a limit of not more than 0.10% in 7 adca is this acceptable why 6 apa control in 7 adca well i think it's a valid thing and i must compliment that vendor who is doing all this hmm. when yeah, i was talking you. to you about additional controls i said don't uh, limit yourself only with uh, uh, penicillins and cephalosporins we talk about many other things like clavulanic acid and i also talked about uh, a case where of 6 apa that if you are manufacturing 6 apa the carrier of 6 apa also needs to be taken into consideration now coming to the limit that they had talked about i think this is a matter of review and uh, it is not uh, possible to right now say arbitrarily yes or no to that okay thank you uh this is about you know you talked about chemical micro limits and evaluation what about visual inspection especially when you have done decontamination and when you checking well visual inspection as in conventional cleaning visual inspection is a requirement and uh, i recall the inspector said that you should have check not only with lights but you should check it with the mirror also where even if small quantity is there in some nook and corner you can see it in the mirror so the expectation today is that you should have adequate lighting with naked eyes first of all inspection no residue followed by the inspection with a uh, light no residue followed by inspection with the mirror also where the reflection of the residue and come and there also you should not have any visible sign of residue thank you uh, how much distance should be there between general and cephalosporin block to avoid contamination any regulatory guidelines on this i think uh, with respect to previous question i already mentioned this that uh, there is no regulatory guideline on that but uh, whichever factories have been approved where they manufacture penicillin cephalosporin general blocks on the same site and if the uh, the distance is about uh, 75 meters uh, it has been found to be okay great thanks i think you had answered but that this uh, that, but question that doesn't mean that if you have 50 meters it will not be okay but if somebody has 10 or 20 meters definitely they will say oh it is too close okay thanks Yeah. Uh, now uh, this is about you know against segregation. Now, if the top person in the quality system department is the same uh, for both penicillin and non-penicillin, then what is expected actually with respect to avoid contamination? So, how would you avoid uh, contamination in such a case? Well, uh, they also should have an SOP in place that whenever a top person visits the beta lactam block. on the same day he will not visit any other manufacturing block like the other employees so he should uh, desist from visiting any other block that's one of the things which they can do secondly whatever signatures that they have to do for all these documents they should uh, preferably go to that block and sign off and not bring any papers to his office so they need to sign up the papers in the same block i think with these two precautions uh, the uh, approach could be satisfactory so uh, vijay just just to interrupt this you know you have got several compliments for making an excellent presentation i will not take individual names but just wanted to convey this to you and now there is again Thank one question so <laughs> yeah there is question mm -hmm. on this penicillin and cephalosporin uh segregation now you have clearly said that it should not be there in the same building but the question is now specific if the the question is that if penicillin is on one floor and cephalosporin 
is on a separate floor in the same building and you have proper control of man movement through access control and restrict the movement you know like you would do it in a different block uh, would this be acceptable are any guidelines there on this from mhra or usfd or pix or any other agency for this kind of a setup where it's in same building but it's on different floors as i was talking to you uh, probably japan is the only country which is seven sigma can anybody in india do the uh, requirement or think about the requirement of doing the bleed studies for epoxy and that too for a period of stability like 1 2 3 up to 60 months they completed in 2014 that study now that kind of thinking uh, unfortunately we are not able to do from the possibilities of penicillin cross contamination so what happens is that okay we do all thing with existing knowledge but tomorrow the new knowledge emerges and due to that new knowledge uh, what is acceptable today tomorrow doesn't become unacceptable tomorrow doesn't become acceptable so why to take that risk because you want to have it as a long term facility so having the if you have it right now it's a different case but if you are talking about putting it in future my suggestion is form no great thanks uh now this is about analytical instrument can we transfer analytical instrument from beta lactam facility to general qc and if yes what is the precaution we should take uh yeah i think it's a very good question which is making me also think think about it uh, <laughs> general trend today is that we should we should have a separate lab in every beta lactam facility people are moving towards that because it becomes very difficult to control so i would suggest that uh, you uh, you get into scenario of having a lab in beta lactam area but i know it is not possible for many companies uh, they cannot just turn around from x to y situation so in this scenario if you want to switch the uh, hplc from a beta lactam block to a non beta lactam block first of all why should you do that i don't understand but you have hplc in beta lactam block that means there is a lab in beta lactam block so my first suggestion would be a firm no but if you have any compelling reasons for that then the issue comes that yes are we in a position to ensure the complete decontamination at in a, in a hplc i don't think we can disassemble the hplc at our end we can at the most dismantle to some extent so there will be some residue sitting in some corners and the only good thing that i see is that hplc most of the handling that you do is with liquid samples you don't do any handling of solid samples that's where decontamination could be possible complete decontamination but look at all the areas where the possibility could exist and if you can uh, ensure that i see no harm in doing this but be very very careful mm, thank you thank you for this exhaustive answer again now there is a question on this segregation uh, and i think you have dealt with this but anyway i'll read this question to you Uh, if the common area you know such as canteen toilet prayer room is it necessary to separate uh, for workers of uh, penicillin and non penicillin absolutely canteen toilet and prayer room have to be separate for each block because people will come together there and uh, they can carry the contamination can spread through that and we don't know how their movement is taking place for various reasons uh, we don't uh, i would not prefer a, the canteen area to be common the prayer room to be common no way thank you uh, now you mentioned noh uh, as the decontamination 
for all amoxicillin and cephalosporin group. Are there any other reagents which also can be used apart from the what you mentioned? Apart from NaOH? I already mentioned, I already talked to you about NaOCl, which was used by Japanese company. NaOCl was used for deactivating beta lactam, and they use SDS as a surface active agent for uh, improving the cleanability. Thank you. Now, again, you have clearly you know, spoken about this QC, how it needs to be different. Uh, now, but there is a specific question here, is that if there is a common QC, uh, what is the actually risk uh, to the general products as such? Common QC is not something which is objected heavily by regulators now. But as I mentioned during my presentation, they are looking for access control for QC at par with manufacturing blocks. You need to have that penicillin product handling area. You should have a product handling facility that when you crush the penicillin product, say 20 tablets you are taking and you are crushing, we have to ensure that whatever powder is generated doesn't get into the environment. So you need to have a product handling equipments in place and with all that, uh, you well, you can ensure that. And one of the foremost thing which uh, I think is a part of uh, good risk mitigation is that everybody, whether he is a worker, who is a manager, who is a sweeper, who, they need to be tested for allergy to penicillins and beta lactams in general. Everybody. So that if at all some contamination goes, it is not going to create any havoc. Even if the visitor comes, uh, you need to have a declaration in place that he or she is not allergic to beta lactams. And with that kind of uh, scenario, uh, I feel you can control this risk substantially. Thank you. Thank you for again a very exhaustive answer. I think your experience of 40 years really speaks when you are answering all these questions, uh, Vijay. Yeah, I'm uh, because I'm hardcore uh, shop floor person. <laughs> yes, yes, that so can, I want to that can less of theory that, and more of practical. <laughs> that can be seen from the answers what you are giving. Okay, so I think people are really enjoying this. Uh, now you talked just now. You talked about you know penicillin sensitivity test. So this question is, is it essential to do penicillin sensitivity test for all employees? That is those who are working in this penicillin uh, cephalosporin block and those who are not working in that block, general block. Yes, absolutely necessary because if there is aerial contamination that will go to the area where you are manufacturing general category of the products. Uh, so as far as the one particular premise is concerned where you have multiple blocks people working in the entire premises need to be tested for penicillin allergy and they need to be free from penicillin allergy great thanks uh, then you mentioned some methods for testing methods so the question is specific that which method is more sensitive for detection of cephalosporins I think you mentioned uh, LC-MS-MS methods. Yeah, yeah. Even microbiology also, but as I mentioned, uh, microbiology method has got one inherent limitation that you cannot really interpret it because I, if I am manufacturing five types of cephalosporin, I am going to zone of, going to get a zone of inhibition, which is coming because of the presence of all five types of cephalosporin. So how do I know what is the quantity of cephalosporin A, cephalosporin B, cephalosporin C, so on and so forth. So nowadays prefer, preferred methods are HPLC and LC-MS-MS. Many people are switching over to LC-MS-MS, but personally I feel uh, HPLC also holds good if you have the facility to uh, inject more quantity like 500 microliters and you can improvise on, on the overall methodology to get the required limit of detection and limit of quantitation. Great, thanks. Now, this is a question about ciprolactam. Uh, so, can ciprolactam be manufactured in the same facility, which is not an antibacterial and is used for different therapy? I don't know if you're aware of this. 
now if i look at the structure of superbilirubin i can comment uh, without looking at the structure i in general i would say if there is a beta lactam ring no so this is this question is from mr damodaran uh, he is going to give uh, in the month of september uh, another uh, webinar for us so damodaran you can write to vijay you have vijay's email id please write to him uh, he will help you out with this uh, and send him the structure of cipro ciprolactam okay now let's see now i think uh, uh, can you recommend a decontamination company to decontaminate a facility black pharma company okay now i, I don't think, think uh, uh, you need any company you can do it yourself very well hmm. only yeah. the approach has to be first i don't think we need to hire any company great i think after seeing at your presentation uh, they can do it themselves uh, no issue with that uh, okay now this is again can persons from penicillin block and non penicillin block travel in the same bus while leaving the company yes why not because Absolutely. you yeah you, you are uh, going to decontaminate many of the companies have got uh, specific precautions like air showers when people are exiting out hmm? so if you have good uh, measures in the place uh, no harm in allowing people to travel in the same bus okay so vijay there still there are several questions so i think we'll just Maybe take one last two yeah mm -hmm. we'll just take one last one and then you know we'll tell them to write to them uh, and this is just uh, about air shower we just spoke about air shower is air shower required in general block also during entry and exit you know when it is a uh, when it is close to an uh, uh, penicillin or cephalosporin block generally that may not be required unless you are manufacturing a highly potent uh, general category dpr thanks okay so with this we'll end the question answer session because still there are about 50 60 questions and we won't be able to take it now so vijay no. if you can just read out your email id because many people have asked that question what is your email id if you can just so all of you can see on the screen uh, vijay has put that Uh, email id you can write to him and i'm sure he will uh, help you uh, with this would you would you like to just uh, read out your email id v u kshir sagar v for victory u for umbrella kshir sagar k s h i r s a g a r @gmail.com thank you thank you so much so we will end the webinar with this and before that let me thank vijay for uh, putting all the efforts to prepare this uh, presentation and then yeah. again taking so much efforts answering the questions almost for 30 to 35 minutes thank you vijay thank you so much thank you.